Okay, ready. All right. Whoops. Let me share the screen first. Okay. All right, share screen, here we go. Okay, can everyone see that? <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> okay, good even, evening and welcome back to uh, for most of you, um, I think uh, quite a few of you have heard the discussions that uh, we had in September and October. And this is the third of a, of a series and the last in terms of this topic. Um, and if there's someone on, uh, on the Zoom uh, conference who has not had a chance to uh, listen to or see the discussions that we had in September and October, I would encourage you to go back because a lot of what I'll be talking about is built on what was discussed. Um, I would like first like to thank the African American Cultural Society uh, for uh, uh, sponsoring this uh, discussion and also the Unitarian Universal Congregation of Ormond Beach. Uh, I, I really appreciate uh, your support and, and assistance. And a big shout out to Reinhold, who came up with this idea and twisted my arm to do it. And so um, uh, we have to really give Reinhold credit for um, getting me to a point where I would um, uh, do these uh, discussions. Okay, so let's go ahead and start. Um, I will begin by speaking with you in the oldest uh, written language known to man, Otep Ankh Ndep Sapnep. And that translates into greetings, life, prosperity, and health. I think this is a language that uh, if uh, people would go back and take the time to study it, that uh, it would be well worth the, uh, their time and uh, well worth their being able to explore for themselves and, and find the, the greatness of these people who, who lived uh, approximately six, 7,000 years ago and were able to uh, understand the laws of nature to the point where they were able to manifest it and bring it into reality and create the greatest civilization known to man. It's a, a, a wonderful language and you will be amazed at how articulate and rational they were when they, uh, talked about the universe, nature, and our relationship to nature in terms of um, truth, justice, order, and righteousness. Um, I want to start with Herodotus, who is the father of Western history. And Herodotus was the, the first person to really start writing about what was happening during his time um, between 485 and 425 uh, before the Common Era. Uh, he took detailed notes and he wrote about his observations. Um, one of his observations, uh, since he had traveled uh, from the Delta all the way down to uh, Nubia in terms of uh, ancient Kemet or what we now call Egypt was he was up in, uh, in on the Black Sea and he made a notation in terms of the Kosheas and, and how they looked 
And he basically stated that the Koshians are black with woolly hair like the Egyptians and Ethiopians. Now, Koshians at that time was located where present day Georgia is, right off the Black Sea between Russia, Syria, Turkey, up in that area. And so Herodotus, the father of history was saying that the folk up here were, were black, just like the folk in, in Egypt and Ethiopia. Okay, and this, these are his direct observations. Now, Herodotus uh, wrote extensively and he also said, I want to read this verbatim so that we can get a feel for what Herodotus saw and observed. The Egyptians, they say, were the first to discover the solar year and to portion out its course into 12 parts. They obtained this knowledge from the stars. To my mind, they contrived this year much more cleverly than the Greeks for these last every other year intercalate a whole month, which means that the Greeks inserted a month, okay, every other year. But the Egyptians dividing the year into 12 months of 30 days each, and every year a space of five days besides, thereby the circuit of the seasons is made to return with uniformity. And so what Herodotus is really saying is that, uh, that the Egyptian year, 365 days, they had 360 days, but their calendar was 30 days, uh, and it consists of a 10 day week. And we have the documents that show that at the end of that 10 day week, uh, the workers would have uh, a day or two off. All right, so it was 30 days a month and at 360 days in the last five days, they would have festivals uh, for the various uh, deities, et cetera. And if you look at 365 days, the calendar would come back around for a complete cycle. And this is what um, Herodotus was talking about every 1,460 years. Because if you divide 365 days by 20, 0.25, because it was 0.25, uh, it was a quarter of a day less than the solar year, which they knew because they would, it would reconcile itself every 1,460 years. So their, their uh, view of time was astonishing in, in, in terms of the fact that they understood that their calendar would come back to its beginning after 1,460 years, which is really phenomenal. Okay, Herodotus goes on to say, the Egyptians, they went on to affirm, first brought into use the names of the 12 guards, which the Greeks adopted from them. And as we go on, I'm going to show you uh, the African deities and how the Greeks just basically took the attributes and renamed them. And they first elected altars, images, and temples to the gods, and also first engraved upon stone the figures of animals. In most of these cases, they proved to be, to me, that they that what they said was true. And they told me that the first man who ruled over Egypt was Min. And that in his time, all Egypt, except the uh, uh, Thebia canon, was a marsh. None of the land below Lake Maris then showing itself above the surface of the water. Because what he's saying is then, when they first, uh, uh, formed uh, Kemet, that part of it was marshland and um, some of it was um, uh, underwater. This is the distance of seven days sail from the sea up the river. Okay, now this is the father of uh, our Western history. And here in his book, book two of Herodotus, he, he, he lists the Egyptian deities and then shows you which uh, Greek deities were uh, copied. Okay, for example, Horus 
that's the Greek name, but the African name was Haru. And Apollo took on the attributes of, Hara, of Haras, of, of, um, of Haru. And so we go down the list, same thing with Isis. And so all of these gods were based, Zeus was Amun. And we talked about Amun when we were talking about the uh, Memphite theology. And uh, so he lists all of the Egyptian deities and all of the Greek deities. And basically the bottom line was that he said all of the Greek gods and goddesses were copied from Africa. They just took the attributes and came up with the, the Greek names. Now let's go to Thales, who is the first Greek philosopher. Now Thales uh, went to Egypt prior to Herodotus, but I wanted to start with just the father of history. And now we're gonna to go to the first Greek philosopher. And so in terms of uh, uh, Western civilizations, the, the Greeks view of the world was based on the comedic teachings. Because we have to remember that the Greeks went to Egypt for their education and they basically uh, took that information and knowledge back to, to Greek. So all of them went. I mean, the main scholars like um, Thales, um, Hippocrates, uh, Pythagoras spent 22 years studying in Africa. Think about it, 22 years Pythagoras uh, studied in Africa and he never in any of his writings claimed that he came up with the properties of the right triangle. He never took credit for that, even though we now give him credit, he never took credit for that. Socrates went, Plato, okay? And they studied at the uh, Temple of Arpeta Suit, which I'm gonna show you, which is now, they call Wasset, it's now called Luxor. Uh, they studied spirituality, science, mathematics. And at that time, everything was integrated into a whole. So there was no separation between the, the science and the spirituality and mathematics. They were all part of a whole. And I think this is important to remember, okay? Um, now, the Greeks, view of the world was based on the teachings that they got in Africa. Um, their focus on reason led to the age of enlightenment, which was the basis for our worldview today. There was a major difference, however, because with the Africans, everything was integrated as one whole part and all of the parts, the science, the mathematics, um, and the spirituality were all contained in one. But the Greeks focused more on the reason and, and, and the rational thought, which edged out the spirituality, which is the view of existence that we have today. Because oftentimes our science will contradict the religions of today. But we live with these contradictions because everything is separated, okay? So even though our science may contradict our religions because everything is uh, separated in different departments, in different buckets, then we live with these contradictions. Now, um, despite the Overwhelming evidence and proof, Africa's contributions to world civilization and culture are not acknowledged or betrayed. And even today, and it's very, uh, you know, that's one of the reasons I do what I do, because this information is not taught in the schools. And uh, so, and in, in the 1800s, we, uh, Africa was basically written out of any contribution to Europe's rise to greatness. And the reason for that was that it had to be suppressed because there's no way that you could institute uh, uh, chattel slavery 
based on the premise that Africans were less than human and inferior, and at the same time say that they were in the forefront of civilization. So as a result, this uh, rise to power was on the backs of enslaved Africans, but the history and the information uh, regarding African contribution to uh, world civilization were suppressed. Now, what I'm going to do here is give you an example of what the Greeks uh, encountered when they went to Africa for their studies. Um, this is in Waset, uh, like I said, what we call Luxor. And this is the temple of Luxor. And you will be able to see for yourself. Now, of course, this has been in decay and a lot of the structures have been destroyed, but it will give you an idea of, of the greatness of this civilization. And by the way, a pedal suit is larger than any of the cathedrals uh, that we have in the world today. That's the Nile River. And the Temple of Luxor is on the east bank. Your overhead view of the Temple of Luxor. Look at the the pillars. We now call these pillars Greek architecture, but they're really our, our African architecture because the Greeks copied this once they started coming to Africa. And these pillars are so huge that when we were there, five of us with outstretched arms, it took five of us to, to surround these pillars. And they were in beautiful colors because you can still see underneath where it, the weather hasn't uh, eroded the colors, the beautiful brilliant colors that they used. See where am I? Okay, here we go. Plato. Okay. Uh, oh, that. Uh, here we go. Okay, Plato. Now, Plato, and I'm sure most people have heard of Plato. This is what Plato said: The Ethiopians have given us arithmetic, geometry medicine, and the sciences. But the greatest science given to us is writing itself. So here's Plato acknowledging that it was the Africans who basically had mastered the science of writing. And when he spent his 22 years there, he was able to come back and uh, use that knowledge and information he gained to push the civilization of Greek uh, Greece forward. And uh, in his Republic, uh, Plato also describes a uh, a hierarchy 
in terms of the Greeks, when they got, when they were taught the African spirituality and the science uh, and the, in the, in nature, in terms of the rational, um, um, uh, the rational, the rationality of nature, they focus more on, 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 on rationality. In other words, reason and discipline. And uh, here again, when I talked about the duality uh, last month, uh, the, uh, the importance of the duality that we lived in a realm of duality. Well, we, they, uh, they were taught the high self reason pursues knowledge, reason and discipline, and the lower self, which is our animalistic nature, which basically we try to overcome and we try to focus on the higher self. But it's a constant struggle for all humans to overcome the animalistic nature that the body brings. The ancient African called it fretters. In other words, it's every day that we wake up, we try to rise to a level that our mind would take us versus our body. And now, based on uh, a papyrus that's about a thousand years old, papyrus, the father of math uh, uh, Pythagoras, learned calculus and geometry uh, in Africa. Okay. And the Greeks gave the uh, Africans credit for their education. In fact, Aristotle stated that Egypt was the cradle of mathematics. But they, when the Greeks got hold of this knowledge and they were educated, they formed their own interpretations of what they learned and built upon that. So they took this information and this knowledge and they built upon it, okay? And, and enhanced it for their civilization. So what they were able to do was to focus on reason. And by focusing on reason, then they basically sort of uh, pushed the emotional part to the side and also didn't focus on the spirituality. So the concepts of spirituality and reason began to separate, whereas in Africa, they were all part of the whole, but the Greeks took this and focused primarily on reason, uh, logic, and the separation was made. And that's how the concept of religion was born, which was separated from nature, per se. Where it was all part of the whole, then it was separated. So that's how we got the concept of religion, which we uh, basically use today. All right, so um, this is the overall thrust of what happened. First, the Greeks started going to Africa for the education. Uh, they were taught mathematics, logic, the sciences. And then once they were uh, taught that information, they took it back to Greece but they focus more on the reason. And when you read their writings, uh, such as in the Republic, which um, stated that only men who have proven over time that they were worthy and had demonstrated rational thought should be leaders. And in fact, I think Aristotle was right on point. I think that if we had the system here in America, um, where our presidents had to prove over time that they were rational, that they were thoughtful, and that they were humane, then we could uh, probably uh, avoid some of the issues that we that we have had in the past. But anyhow, that's uh, uh, the whole concept of the of the Greeks going to Africa, uh, being educated, bringing that back, and then using it to build and develop the Greek civilization, which we the rest of the world has modeled itself on. Now, the people of Kemet are called themselves the, uh, the country, they call themselves the black people, okay, pronounced Kemetio. And these, these are the meta nature that they use. 
burnt charcoal, an owl, owl and bread, and then the people are the determinants. So what this is saying is black people, okay? There are no other people in the world who will use burnt charcoal to represent themselves. So we have all of this information about who these people were, but even today, because of what has happened in the world, uh, whenever we look at documentaries or we look at movies, the ancient Egyptians are never shown as black people, okay? And I contend the reason for that is because it upsets the apple cart. You, you, you can't, uh, in other words, the whole premise of Africans being enslaved was because of the fact that they were inferior, they didn't have a culture, and therefore slavery was justified based on the fact that Africans were somehow less than human. And when the true history is known and told, then people can no longer use that as an excuse to, um, to for our enslavement. And the whole premise of slavery and the justification for it just crumbles, okay? Um, also, uh, the uh, Africans in Kemet also called themselves, it's called the land of the black people, okay? And now some of the noted uh, Egyptologists even today would try to argue that they were talking about the, the black mud. And I pose to all of you, you name me any people in the world who name themselves after the mud in a country. Um, not the Greeks. Uh, we, go to, we go to Rome, we go to the Romans, we go to France, we go to the French. Okay, so there are no people in the world who have named themselves after the mud. They name themselves basically the country and the people's name are similar. So it's a ridiculous notion, but there are, there are, there are scholars today who try to make that point, try to say that they weren't talking about the people, even though we see the determinants back here where they are referring to people. Okay, so this is a battle that's going on even today. Now I'm getting back to my art because uh, when we talked about my art, it's the merge, uh, merging of spirituality and science, the elements and the laws of nature. And so that the commissions taught that the universe is rational, which the Greek name, Greeks name uh, logos. So the Greeks focus on the rational aspects of man. Okay, it was, it was rationality uh, that they focused on in terms of their uh, processing of this information. Now, let's move on to the first time in history that man was depicted as a god. This is a Tsar, okay? This is the first depiction and the oldest depiction we have of man depicted as a guard. Okay, he has the, the, the crook and the frail and he has his right hand. If you notice, they always put the right hand over the left. And the symbolic meaning for the crook is that he would gather the followers Etc. However, oftentimes discipline was needed, and that was the purpose of the frail. Now, Asar, and I'm going to uh, talk about some of these stories, was resurrected from death, and then he dwelt in heaven. And there are a number of stories about uh, Asar and his death. But this is the first depiction of a man as God. 
Now, in the in the in the temple of Luxor, you have a um, on the wall, and it's still there. Um, I saw this for myself. It's fading now, but it's a depiction of the Annunciation, the conception, the birth, and the adoration. Let me walk you through this and, and explain this. All right, on the left here, we have the god Jehudi. The Greeks renamed him Thor. All right, and it's, he has the head of an ibis bird because the ibis bird was known for his fine articulation of speech. And he was associated with writing and speaking. So he's announcing to the virgin queen that she is to give birth to the coming son. Okay, that's the first scene. The second scene, the god Yep. And he is in, in Egyptian mythology, he is the Holy Ghost. And then we have the goddess Hathor, the holding ox. Hathor is holding one, two, uh, sets nostrils, and Yef is holding one to her um, head. Now, if you notice, look at her stomach. It's protruding slightly, which is telling us that she is pregnant, okay, by this Holy Spirit. Let's go to the next scene. A set is sitting on the birthing stool. All right, and we have the nurses, and one of the nurses is holding up the holy child that was born. All right, now we go to the adoration. The holy child is ad uh, admired by a moon. And, and the moon is noted for being the, the Holy Spirit behind all creation. And behind the moon are three men behind, uh, behind him with gifts, all right? In the right hand, uh, they had the, um, the ark, which represents internal life right here. All right, and I'm sorry, in, in, in the, I'm, I got that backwards. They're holding the gifts in the right hand and the eternal life with their left hands. So here we, ha here we have a story that's familiar to all of us that's 1700 BCE, 1700 BCE, right here on the walls of this temple, okay? And you can't really look at this, and if, if you had just looked at this on your own, you probably wouldn't have been able to figure it out. But you have to really have it, it explained. But once it's explained, then you can see these four scenes represents the Annunciation, the Conception, the Birth, and the Adoration. Adoration. Now, some of you may feel a little uncomfortable with this information, but this is true, these are facts, uh, this is evidence, it's still there. Um, if COVID-19 uh, weren't in existence, you could jump on a plane and in 12 hours, you could be in Luxor and you could go to that temple and you could see it for yourself. It's still there. Here we have uh, the first Madonna and child, a set in her roof. Let me show you a number of these. Here's another depiction of a set in a roof. Okay, now, the first Madonna in the world was a set in her roof. I showed you the scene 
in the temple of Luxor. And that is why in Europe today, you have over 500 black Madonnas and child today. Um, so this whole idea of the Madonna and child started in Africa and then it moved to other parts of the world. In fact, where the temple of, uh, where Notre Dame is, that was a temple of Isis in ancient times. Here we have the first Trinity. The difference is we have Asar, the father, um, and Haru, the son, and the mother. Instead of the Holy Ghost, we have uh, a set. So we have the father, son, and the mother. And the set was the virgin who gave birth to the Holy Son. The reason that um, he has a hawk um, head is because that is representing spiritual vision. The hawk is noted for its keen eyesight. It can see for, for miles. So it will see prey and it will zero in on the prey and basically scoop down and, and pick it up. The Africans noted that. And so they attributed this spiritual vision and they put it on one of their deities. So that's why he has a hawk head, okay, to denote spiritual vision. But we have the father, son, and the mother. Here we have again, Haru, Asar, and Aset. Now, we're looking at the Tekken. And I need to tell you a story to put this in perspective. Um, Asar was, was appointed king. His brother, Set, uh, did not like it. He was jealous. So he tricked him into uh, lying in a coffin. He supposedly was going to measure it for a friend. And then he closed it and sealed it up. And basically, um, there are other stories where he cut the body into 14 pieces. Um, a set had a vision, his virgin wife, because they had not had time to consummate the marriage, that that his body was in Syria. So she went to Syria, approached the king, and she found the body in a cedar tree. She found 13 parts of his body. She could not find the 14th part, which was his phallus, because it was thrown in the Nile River and supposedly eaten by a catfish. That's why the ancient Africans on the Nile didn't eat catfish. Okay. So the Tekken is a symbol to represent the missing part of a SARS body. Now, we see these all over the world. In fact, we see one in the rear of the, of behind the White House. Okay, so here we have in the nation's capital, an African symbol uh, that is associated with an African deity. We see these on numerous grave sites. Uh, they, they're prominent all over the world. In fact, wherever I went, whenever I would see one, I used to take photos of them. I mean, even in Charlotte, North Carolina, they're all over the place. 
okay, these, uh, these, these techings. And this is why it's important to understand history because once you understand that whenever you see one of these symbols, then it can be a reminder of the great and wonderful history that Africans brought to the world, okay? We know how great Europeans are and what they've done, the Asians, the Indians, okay? But the Africans are not put up with everyone else in terms of their contributions, okay? And again, that had to be done in order to justify uh, Africans' enslavement, but we still see it carried on today, okay? Even in contemporary times, Black folk are lazy. Black folk need help. They can't get into Harvard or Yale because they are somehow less intelligent than other folk. I mean, we still see all of this, all of this stuff that happened in 1800s where they had to suppress this information and promote a, a story that dictated that Africans would be at the bottom of, of the human uh, heap, if you will to justify slavery. And a lot of that carries on today. And it's unfortunate that because uh, Africans and African-Americans have been brought up with this kind of uh, thoughts and these ideas, a lot of Africans and, and African-Americans don't feel comfortable with themselves either because of some of this narrative, okay? But again, now, if you notice here, with this, there's one on the left and there's one on the right. I talked about duality, how important duality is, that we live in a ream of duality as humans. The left represents the past, the right represents the future, the Tekken uh, that was on the right. These Tekken have been taken all over the world, by the, by the way. We have one in Central Park and we have one in Vatican Square in the center of Vatican Square. We have them all over the world in Paris, et cetera. And when you as a human walk through these two Tekkens, then it's, it's a reminder or reinforcement to stay balanced that you have to recognize the past uh, and, the, and the future, but you have to stay in the present. So you can't get too focused on the past at the expense of the present or the future or get too focused on the future at the expense of the present and the past. So it, it represents a balance. So for example, if you go to St. Augustine and you cross the Bridge of Lions, it's the same uh, uh, symbols of two lions but it's the duality of nature. So when you're driving between those two lines, it should be a reminder to stay in balance, okay? That we have to balance out the past, present, and the future. It is extremely important. Now here we have a scene of the after, uh, afterlife and they had rituals and they were, uh, had something in the Coptic uh, jaws in terms of the body parts, et cetera. Uh, so they had a, a, a 70 day ritual that they utilized for people who, who died. Here we have a boat to the afterlife because they focused on the fact that once we uh, died, our physical bodies decayed, that we had to guide ourselves through all of these trials and tribulations that we were tested before we got to be judged. And uh, here's, and this, this is phenomenal, here's Khufu's boot, a boat. Khufu was the king who was responsible for commissioning the Great Pyramid. It's one of the oldest, largest and uh, ships intact from antiquity. It's 143 feet long 
and 19 and a half feet wide. Now, my friends who have boats have told me that you should never go to sea with any boat that's less than 30 feet if you're gonna really go out into the sea. So here we have a boat that's 143 feet long and it ties right into the extensive research that Dr. Ivan Van Sertima uh, did when he wrote the book, They Came Before Columbus, The African Presence in, in, in the Americas. We, we, we kind of know from dating the artifacts in Olmec civilization that Africans were coming back and forth to the Americas um, over 3,200 years before Columbus, before 1492. Now, why did Columbus get the idea that he could sail west and get to the east? Well, Columbus was uh, uh, living in, in, in Portugal, and Portugal, uh, they were the first Europeans to uh, start enslaving Africans. The Arabs had been enslaving Africans for, for decades prior to uh, the Portuguese. So the, so, the, so the enslavement of Africans had already been set up by the Arabs, okay? And um, so when the, when the Portuguese were going down the west coast of Africa, some of the Africans would tell them that there was a land to the west. So uh, Columbus, he didn't know for sure, but he had heard this. And so that was one of the reasons why this whole expedition uh, came to fruition because of what he had heard. Of course, when they were able to gather the funds and, and the crew and he started sailing west, he, because they didn't know lat latitude or longitude, uh, he didn't have a clue as to where he was going. All he knew, he was going west. But what he did do once he left Europe, they stopped off the coast of Africa and he changed sails. He used the African sail because it allowed him to sail and he didn't have to have the wind directly behind him. The Africans had already figured that out, okay? Uh, so all of this narrative fits together in terms of the Africans being able to come back and forth to the Americans because here we have a boat that's 1700 years old that is that could travel the seas. All right, so now here's Khufu. So he was uh, ruler of the fourth dynasty and um, to show you how there's nothing new under the sun, uh, for a while in the black community, especially in the 60s and 70s, people wore what we call the Khufu hat. So this hat, a lot of people were wearing in the 60s and the 70s, okay? But so here's the king of the fourth, fourth dynasty. But it's interesting that even when you look at the History Channel and Discovery Channel, when they depict the Egyptians, they never depict them as Africans. Sometimes they depict them with light, you know, you, you can't even tell what they are. I mean, it's like, you know, it's so it's really interesting even today that the world still does not want to acknowledge that the Africans on the Nile were the ones who laid the foundation for the civilization of the world. And so that's one of the reasons why we're still having issues with all of these negative perceptions about Africans and African-Americans. It carries on to today because this information is not taught. And um, if, if someone is, uh, does teach it, then they are basically questioned and people try to refute it. Okay, now this is the judgment scene. Um, again, here's Arnie, and we know he has, uh, he's dead because he's dressed in all white. Um, here's Jehudi, 
okay? And he has a um, the head of a jackal. Now, why did they use the head of a jackal? They used the head of a jackal to represent keen and fine judgment. The Africans noted that jackals would only eat their uh, meal when the animal had decayed to a certain point where they could get the most nutrition out of it. So there was a time period when once something was dead, they would wait until that perfect time when they could get the most nutrition out of that uh, dead animal. So the Africans noted that, so they uh, attributed keen and fine judgment. That's why he is adjusting the scale for Arnie who is going to be judged. You can see Jehudi here adjusting the scale. Look at this, the feather of my art. This is my art here. The, the, the woman with the feather on her head. Okay. Here we have the feather here, which represents my art. And this is the heart. And he's being judged um, against the 42 principles of my art. You know, we've gone over those truth, justice, order, righteousness, et cetera. And you've heard the phrase, your, your heart is as light as a feather. That, well, that's where this comes from. Because if Arnie's heart is lighter than a feather, that means that he has lived by the principles of my art. If his heart were heavier, then you have this monster here that's ready to devour his soul because he's dead now. So his, they have the body here, but this is really his soul. He's being judged, okay? So we can see that on his heart was lighter than the feather. So we have Anubis here, which is represented by the Ibis uh, head. And the reason they use the Ibis head because the Ibis has a beautiful sound. They make beautiful sounds. So they use that to represent articulation of speech and writing. So contrary to what we've been told in the past, they weren't worshiping animals. They used the attributes of the animal to convey a message. All right. So since Arnie lived according to the principles of my art, here he is um, with Haru. This is the Holy Son that I showed you the scene of, the adoration and uh, how he was born, etc. And he has a hawk head. And I explain why he has a hawk head because of spiritual vision. He is being presented to his father, Asa. So what this is saying is that you can't get to the father unless you go through the son. Okay, we've heard that before. Now, behind Asar is Aset and her sister, Nephews, which represents uh, death and life. So we, again, we have the principles of duality here. We're seeing all this duality how life is, we live in a realm of duality. And for anyone who is in one of the secret societies, a star is sitting on the square. Okay, and I know that's important for a lot of the secret societies. Okay, now let's decode this scene even more. Up at the top, these are the jurors that are judging whether or not Arnie, what the verdict will be, okay? After examining his life, in addition to it being weighed. So here again, we have um, Haru and we have Asar, the father and the holy son which represents the spirituality and they're holding an ankh, the symbol of life. And we have, we have the, the judge. Now, the jurors, how many do we have? One, 
two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Very interesting. Our legal system, our court system, 12 jurors and the judge, and you swear on the Bible. Okay, you take an oath that you're going to speak truth. You're going to tell the truth. Coincidence, you be the judge. Okay, but here it is, thousands and thousands of years ago in Africa. Now, when we go to some of the oldest uh, texts in the world, one of those books is the Books of Coming Forth by Day and Night. And I want to dispel this myth about Africans uh, worshiping a multitude of, of gods. That's not true. They had a multitude of deities, but they were similar to our angels. Okay, they had certain roles that they played in terms of our existence. So this is verbatim from the coming forth by day and night. God is one and only, and none other existed with him. God is the one, the one who have made all things. God is a spirit, a hidden spirit, the spirit of spirits, the great spirit of the commissions, the divine spirit. God is from the beginning, and he had been from the beginning. He hath existed from of old and was when nothing else had been. He existed when nothing else existed, and what existed he created after he had come into being. He is the father of beginnings. God is the eternal one. He is the father of beginnings. God is the eternal one. He is eternal and infinite and endureth forever and I. Now, these are some of the oldest uh, spiritual books in the world. Okay, so this is what they were seeing. Okay, now we go with um, E. Wallace Bodge, who was a noted Egyptologist um, from England. And he wrote a book titled o o Osiris and the Egyptian Resurrection. And Bodge had spent his life studying the meta nature. He, he was an expert on the language. He's written numerous books about uh, uh, the Africans on the Nile. This is what he says. Now, if we examine the religions of modern African peoples, we find that the beliefs underlying them are almost identical with those described above. As they are not derived from the Egyptians, it follows that they are the natural product of the religious mind of the natives of certain parts of Africa, which is the same in all periods. The evidence of the older travelers, the Bosses, Mongo Park, Livingstone, and others, and that of more recent travelers, such as Dr. Nassau and Sir Harry Johnston, proves that almost every African people with whom they came in contact possessed a name for God Almighty in whose existence and power they firmly believed. Their attitude towards God was and is exactly that of the ancient Egyptians. So this spirituality that uh, Bodge and all of these travelers from Europe noticed was how spiritual that these Africans were. And you find it today. When I was in Ghana, 
I was astonished at how religious they were. And you would find uh, photos of Jesus on the back of cabs, on the back, on the front of businesses. They would name their, their businesses that you saw posters with all of the preachers. It was incredible. I think uh, for most of us, we were astonished how they seem to take in religion and more so than even African Americans here in America. And you know that African Americans here are very, very religious. Okay. Um, so it's this, this spirituality that these Africans bring is something that's always been there. And I think that's one of the reasons why when African Americans in general try to live the tenets of Christianity, okay? Uh, that's why I think it would be very, very difficult to have a black man who would, was running for president and who had a history of doing bad deeds, I just don't think you could get a large percentage of African Americans to vote for him because of this, uh, because of this spirituality. Okay. Now I could be wrong, but when I see this, okay, and I see how they take to this. And, and they adhere to it and they try to live that particular life. And now I'm not talking about the criminals and all the people who are just all over the place. I'm talking about the, 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 the general population of African Americans. I've seen it all my life. I was brought up in the church, I, my mother, the whole community. I mean, everybody went to church and our whole lives were centered around the church. The church was the hub for our, our, our life, our entertainment, our, our socialization, okay? Um, so it's just really interesting how Barge was able to uh, see that and all of the Europeans who traveled to Africa saw that and he basically said it was the same as what he saw in Egypt. Okay, now I'm gonna show you some of the, uh, a few of the 500 Madonnas that are in Europe. Here's one in Rome, Russia, Germany. Okay, and the Pope coat of arms has the Black Madonna and baby and baby Jesus. So, in terms of the Madonna and the Holy Child, we have before after and way after. So this story continues. Okay. Now, some of the rituals that we, that I practice and all of you have practiced, I've been baptized, I'm sure most of you have. Um, here we have the king being uh, baptized with Haru, the Holy Son, and Jehudi. All right, it was noted for fine judgment and articulation of speech, rather. All right. Here we have anointing baptism again. Haru and Jehudi. We also have a saw. Uh, the first man depicted as a god. And he's pouring water on the wheat. The wheat is growing up from Asar's body, the bread. And he was the first to cultivate grapes and wine. So is there any coincidence that we drink the wine, okay, and eat the bread? This is a, this is a carry on from, from, from these uh, our stories. By the way, um, Haru, who was a Saw's son, was born on December the 25th. So were numerous other deities 
That's why when the British were in, <clears throat> had conquered India and uh, the, um, the, the, the church uh, uh, preachers would come and try to convert the Indians into Christianity, they weren't that successful. The reason they weren't that successful was because when they told them their story, the Indians said, well, that's basically the same story that we have. So why should I take your story when my story is basically the same? Because their God was born on December 25th and you go on and on and on. So that's why you find today that there are just a small segment of Indians who have converted to Christianity. Okay. Now here we have the first depiction of circumcision. Okay. Okay, at the time this was done, um, we didn't have Abraham. Okay, and the reason that the, um, the, the, the commissions uh, cut off the foreskin from a man's penis was because they wanted to cut off the feminine part and for cleansing this. That's what they said in their writings. So that was the reason they did that. But they believed in circumcision. They were the first people in the world to circumcise males. And here we have the comedic version of the Ark of the Covenant. Here's the Ark. Okay. You notice that you have um, the winged creatures, the cherubim above, can be seen on the walls. Okay. So this is similar to the Ark of the Covenant, and it's carried on the golden poles. All right, now I'm gonna move you to the comedic calendar because I think this is important. And I want to again illustrate like I did with the Oscar uh, last month, how the information in a number of the um, things that we use today have come from Africa. Now here is the uh, depiction of the calendar on the wall, but I'm gonna give you a, the, uh, a drawing so we can see what they were seeing. So here we have a glyph that represents a day. This one represents a month. Uh, this is for one, uh, all the way up to nine. And when nine, you have here, and then you have 10. So here we have, we can read this as the first day, okay, of the first month, okay? The first day of the first month, the second day, third day, fourth day, fifth day, sixth day, until we get to the ninth. And so then we change from them using just sticks. They use this as a symbol for nine, and here's 10. And then we go back and repeat the same thing again. Okay, but it is very, very logical. Here we have 11 day, 12th day, 13th day, 14th day. Okay, until we get again to the 19th, all the way to the end. Very, very logical. And if you notice, it's 30 days. Okay, 10 day weeks, three, three, and the weeks, by the way, the week was called a deacon. Okay. A deacon, a week. Okay. So that word was in use prior to us picking it up. Now, so once we understand this history, then we can look at a deck of cards and decode the cards. And we will find that in a deck of cards, we have the African solar year because the Africans were the first people in the world to figure out the 365 and a quarter day. And 
and, and there were reasons. There were reasons for that because it was it was as if the, the Nile Valley was the perfect place because whenever we had the uh, uh, the rising of the sun and Sirius together, that was the start of the African New Year. Okay, but they noticed that every fourth year, the sun would come up a day earlier. The sun and and um, uh, uh, Sirius. So over time, they figured out. Oh, so there's a quarter day that we have to add because what's happening is this 365 days that we are counting every fourth year is coming up a day early. So we must be behind, okay? And so that's how they were able to figure out how to reconcile their calendar every 1,460 years. They would happen to be at the right place on the planet where they could figure uh, these things out because it didn't rain any more than maybe uh, three to four inches a year in, in Kemet. So they had clear skies every day for the most part. And at night they could see the stars. So they were just in the perfect place. And over time they figured this out. So let me show you how this, the person or persons who put together a deck of cards basically use the African solar year. We have 12 face cards, 12 months in a year. We have 13 cards in a suit. We have 13 weeks for each season. Okay, we also have 13 um, new moons a year. Okay, we have 52 cards in a deck. We have 52 weeks in a year. If you look at the even cards uh, in a suit, one, two, three, four, five, and the queen is the even card, six, Four times six gives you 24, which represents the 24 hours in a day. Now, why are quite a few deck of cards red and black? Think about it. Red represents the sun, the day, and black represents the night, okay? If you add up all of the cards, you will get 364. If you use, you know, if you use uh, Jack is 11, 12 is for the queen, 13 for the king. We have jokers, two jokers. If you look up the word joker, it's, the, one of the meanings of joker is the remnants of things. So the big joker represents one and the small joker represents the quarter. So we have the 365 and a quarter days. So this is how information can be put right in front of us and we not have a clue as to what the true meaning of the information is. So when you're playing with cards, you can stretch it to say that you're really playing with your life in a way, because this represents uh, a major component of our existence, the solar year. Now, I want to, uh, that ends my discussion on, on this whole, um, uh, ream of 
the Greeks going to Africa, uh, learning from the Africans and taking their information, uh, reframing it to work for them, and then spreading that to the, uh, throughout the Western world. And all of the similarities between what was happening in ancient Africa and in some of the religions that are ongoing today. Um, if you want to pursue this further, then I have a suggested reading list for you. The first one, the first book I would recommend if you're just starting is Nile Valley Contribution to Civilization by Tony Browder. Tony lives in DC and Harry and I used to go and see him quite often when he would give lectures. And um, it's, uh, uh, and the reason I recommend this book is because it's an easy read. It's large print. Uh, he's broken it down so that you can skip around if you like but it's, it's very comprehensive. And it touches on a number of things that I've mentioned uh, in this discussion. It's, it's a great book. So if you're just going to start out exploring uh, this information for yourself, I would recommend Nile Valley Contribution to Civilization. The next one is Introduction to African Civilization by John G. Jackson. Um, this is very comprehensive. It is a classic. It is one of the best books out there if you want to explore African civilization. The next one is The African Origins of Civilization, Myth or Reality by Dr. Shagan Diop. Now, uh, Shagan Diop was another genius. I mean, he, this man, uh, was able to develop the melanin doses test, which would allow anyone to determine how much melanin was in the mummies in, in, um, in Kemen or in Egypt. Well, once he developed that test, the, the Arabs who now control Egypt wouldn't let him test any of the mummies. They wouldn't let him do it. However, he had a, a friend who was a curator and I think of the museum in, in England, in London, and he allowed him to go in and all he needed was just a mic microscopic piece of the, of, the, of the mummy, allowed him to do the test. And sure enough, the mummies did have melanin. Okay. A great man, he, uh, he was, he, he, he mastered the metal nature. He showed that um, the metal nature was embedded in, in a numerous African languages that are spoken uh, today, such as Wolof. Um, the people in Senegal, they could see the similarities of the words. The same words had the same meanings. So, so because what happened once uh, chemists started being invaded on a regular basis with the, the Persians, the Assyrians, uh, et cetera, Africans started leaving and going to the Western part of Africa, okay? And so they took remnants of the civilization with them. Now, this is a, another wonderful book edited by Ivan Van Sertima, who was uh, just a phenomenal writer and a brilliant scholar, Black women in antiquity. And if you want to know the role that Black women have played in history, this is a must read because you will find uh, women in, uh, in this book that you've never heard of and, never, and they've never been discussed, but just a phenomenal book about what are Black women in antiquity and what their contributions were. The African presence in ancient America that came before Columbus. I reference uh, this book um, in terms of Africans coming back and forth to the Americas 2300 years before Columbus. And this was written by Ivan Van Sertima. And we know that even Columbus said that when Columbus landed on the island Hispanola and the um, 
the natives there told him that they traded with tall black men who would come by on boats periodically. Columbus didn't believe them. So he traded and got some of the spearheads and sent them back to Spain to be essayed. The results came back that yes, those were African uh, spearheads. So Columbus knew that Africans had been here before him. And his son, who wrote a book about his father, also stated in his book that his father told him that Africans had been coming here before him because the natives gave him proof of, of African uh, spearheads. And they're all kind of stuff. We found cocaine in some of the um, mummified bodies in Kemet. And there was no cocaine in Africa. So that came from South America. And we found plants in South America that were only indigenous to Africa. We also, the pyramids that were built in, in, uh, in the Americas had the same north-south axis uh, and, were, and, and were aligned with, these, with the stars, various stars. Also, the 20 Omec heads, and this is an Omec head here, which weigh up to 20 tons, I mean, 40 tons, I'm sorry, uh, are basically all over um, South America. And um, so the Africans, when they came here, they brought some of this knowledge and information and helped the natives jumpstart their civilization, which was the Omec civilization, the first civilization in the Americas. And when they have found the Omec burial sites, they did a, a melanin doses test on the bodies and about 26% of them were, 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 were Africans or the ones who were buried. So that's further proof. Despite all of this, Oh, and by the way, we found meta nature in, in Idaho with some of the Native Americans. Okay. I could go on and on and on about, about uh, the, the, the things that we found in America and in Africa. But despite this, when Ivan Van Sertimer, when this book was published, he was ostracized. And I feel that it, 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 it helped contribute to his early death because he was really taken to task for even suggesting that Africans were coming back and forth to the Americas, okay? Um, and uh, he went about the business of, of spending his life refuting the critics and proving his point. Proving his point. He's written a number of other books to, to further emphasize the fact that they were coming back and forth to the Americas. But this is a, wow, could he write? Just when you, when you read this book, you marvel at how well Dr. Ivan Ben Sertima could write. It's, a, it's another classic book. A must read if you're interested in knowing about early America and the influence on, on the civilizations in the early Americas. Here we have UNESCO, the United Nations Scientific and Education Organization. This is the organization set up by the United Nations to go around the world to look at history and science. So they had a, a meeting in the 70s to settle once and for all whether or not the ancient Egyptians were African. And we're still going through this in the 70s. So the top Scholars in the world met and they had two Africans, Dr. Ivan Van Sertima and Dr. Obinga. And they met and discussed the information and the evidence they had that the ancient Egyptians were Africans. Well, at the end of the chapter, it basically is stated and this is phenomenal. They had the top experts in the world who met to discuss this sole issue to resolve it once and for all. It says that Dr. Obinga and Dr. Diop came so well prepared 
that um, that the other experts uh, couldn't contribute anything, and therefore um, it was unbalanced because Dr. Diop and Dr. Obinga were so uh, well prepared with their evidence and facts, and no one else could um, stand up to their uh, information. Okay, so that was the only meeting that's ever been held from the uh, for the top scholars in the world to debate this issue. So we never had another one. Okay, so even in the seventies, this because this is so important. And this is one of the reasons why I do what I do. I'm trying to, as much as possible, to dis dispel these untruths about Black people and our supposedly inferiority, or somehow we are less than other people in, uh, on the globe, which is nonsense in itself, because People are people. In every ethnic group, you're going to have some geniuses, a few geniuses every while and every now and then. You're going to have smart people, you're going to have people in the middle, and you're going to have people at the bottom. And it has nothing to do with the color of a person's skin. It's so ridiculous. But that narrative still persists, persists because, I mean, persists, I'm sorry, persists because of the fact that. It's still inherited even today with some of the narrative that we, we hear, especially from some of the people even in America. Okay? And it's based on these distortions that have been carried over from generation to generation. Here we have the cult of the Black Virgin. I mentioned to you that we have over 500 Black uh, Madonnas and Chow in Europe. And this uh, in Berg is it's a wonderful book. It goes into the explanations of where they are. So if you if you once the pandemic is over, if you decide to go to Europe, um, please read this book because you may be in some place in Poland or Germany or Spain where you could go and see one of these uh, black virgins for yourself. A great book. Um, Stolen Legacy. Um, this is a, another classic by George G.M. James. Uh, George, Dr. James was a, a, a top scholar in Greek, logic, rhetoric. I mean, he had mastered Greek, the language, et cetera. He taught at Johnson C. Smith and a number of universities. And he wrote this book, The Egyptian Origins of Western Philosophy. So again, I touched on it somewhat, uh, especially uh, last month. But this is a great book if you want to go and see exactly what the Greeks took and how it relates to what, uh, what the Africans had developed. Uh, another classic book. And lastly, we have the teachings of Hotel. This is the oldest intact book we found in the world, intact. We found other papyri that are older than this, but they weren't intact. And when you read this book, it is incredible. Now, Patar Hotep was uh, over 100 years old when he compiled uh, these writings. But he talks about um, good speech, how whenever we say something, that we should practice good speech. He talks about the fact that if you're in a crowd and someone goes negative on you, not to go negative, to maintain your positive stance and the intelligent people who are watching this go on will basically understand that the person who goes negative is a person who is wrong, okay? He talks about how children who don't uh, listen to their parents, don't uh, stumble and bumble and normally have a rough time in life. I mean, all of this knowledge that Africans had basically uh, understood and discovered thousands and thousands of years ago, it is a phenomenal read, 
Um, it's a it's a real thin book, so you you can read it, and, you know, in, in in probably an hour or so. And it was compiled by Asa Hilliard, who I knew, another brilliant scholar, Dr. Hilliard, um, and Larry uh, Williams. With that, Shim Hotel. Peace be upon you. Okay, so I'm ending with the oldest uh, written language in the world. And that is all I have to say this evening. I appreciate your attention, your attention, and I guess I'll turn it back over to Reinhold and we'll uh, we take it from, from there. Thank you very much. Okay, you want to stop sharing the screen and then we'll see who's yes. here. Yes. There we are. There you go, Rob. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, uh, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free to, uh, well, raise your hand and then uh, unmute and speak so that we don't all speak at once. John, go ahead. He's go ahead. I'm trying. Good. Okay. I missed the beginning. What does spirituality mean in this context? Uh, spirituality means that everything in nature is uh, a representation of God. In other words, God manifests uh, uh, itself in everything that we see. In the animal, plant, human life. It's all part of, of God's creation. In fact, the Africans uh, thought that since everything was that we saw was part of God's creation, it should be respected. That's why they only killed to eat. And then when they, oftentimes they killed an animal, they would basically have rituals, etc. And they understood that as a result of that, since we were created by this divine intelligence that we call God, that there was a part of God in us and that it was up to us to find that God in us and resurrect ourselves so that we could walk the path of godliness every day. Understanding that we are not perfect, that we will stumble, but we get up every day and we try to be godlike. Uh, you're muted again, John. Okay. Okay, Marilyn, go ahead. Go ahead and mute, unmute first. Yeah, I uh, lived in Tanzania for a while when I lived in, when I was in the Peace Corps. Okay. And the people there were very, very religious. I kind of attributed it to, there were a lot of uh, Lutherans that came there and evangelized quite a bit. But then there were the, the uh, native Native peoples, indigenous peoples who had their own spiritual beliefs that weren't, you know, Christian based, but, but it's, uh, it's interesting. And I also spent time in Egypt and, and I went to the temple at Luxor. And, okay. So it's really cool. So, Great. Yeah. thank now, you very much. Okay. Marilyn, I do have a question for you. While you were in, in Egypt, did anyone ever? explain to you uh, what you were looking at in terms of the temples and, and some of the uh, yeah. pictures on the walls. Okay, great. Yeah, it was, you know, I didn't take notes or what have you, and, you know, and I didn't buy any books, but, but uh, it was very, very interesting. And, and, and uh, we, we, I went on, a, the only cruise I've ever been on was a, a cruise down the Nile River and we stopped at all these temples, you know, about three or four times every day, we would stop and go into temples, and we get all these lectures. It was it was very oh, interesting. Great, uh, okay. Mr. Jones. Did I see you raise your hand? Yes. 
Unmute yourself. Okay. Yeah, I, I when I went to Egypt, I, I spent about a month there. And mm -hmm. um, I, was, I was very fortunate that we did have a guide that uh, explained exactly what you were talking about. Um, at one point, I thought that I was looking at, and I made a comment to the group that this architecture looks just like Greek architecture. <laughs> so, <laughs> the guy with the guy explained to me, he said that uh, uh, the reason it looks like Greek architecture is because there is no Greek architecture. This is African <laughs> architecture that Greeks took. Uh, but that was not my question. Um, as late as the 18th century, when Napoleon invaded Egypt, he took uh, 165 scholars with him to Egypt. Was that the the transfer of knowledge still going on as late as the 18th century? Oh, ab absolutely, because remember, the Rose of the Stone, we weren't able to, uh, let me give a little history here. Uh, Emperor Justina and Theodorus shut down the African temples and they forbid anyone to uh, read or use the meta nature. So it was lost until the Rosetta Stone was deciphered, okay? And that was in the 18, early 1800s. So up until, that, up until that time, they weren't able to, 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 read, to read the uh, inscriptions. Now, Napoleon, when he went there and he took, you were right, uh, over a hundred and some scholars and uh, a number of, of, uh, of his military, when they, and they stayed there three months, uh, yeah, three to four months, when they went back to um, France, it's really interesting. They came up with the metric system. The metric system is based on the rotation of the planet, okay, in relationship to the cosmos, okay? Because we know that the Africans had figured out the, the, how, the, how fast the, the planet is rotating. And that's when they were able to develop the whole concept of a, of a, of a second, a minute, all the things with the 24 hours, the 365 and a quarter days, et cetera. And they underst also understood the procession of the equinox, okay, where you had this cycle of, they call it the great year of 25,890 years for all of the stars to, to circumvent the polar star, okay? But yes, this knowledge was taken back. So the metric system is based, based on nature. That's why, if all of you remember, back in the, what, in the 60s and 70s, they were gonna to try to make us move to the metric system. Yeah. But it was a complete failure. <laughs> the reason they wanted us to move to the metric system because most of the rest of the world is on the metric system and is tied to nature. The decimal system is something that we made up. It works, but it's not based on on the laws of nature per se. Yeah. You know. One more question, and then I'll be done. Uh, uh, are, are you familiar with um, uh, uh, C. F. Volney's? Um, uh, depiction of the Africans contributing to the civilization of the Western world and Thomas Jefferson's refusal to trend to he, 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 he interpreted the book or, uh, or translated the book to English, but he didn't translate everything that Volney said. He didn't, tra he, 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 he didn't translate the parts that talked about black people contributing to Western society. We talk about that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, the ruins of empire by Count uh, Valdney. Um, he spent uh, his, his, his life studying ancient Kemen traveling around the world. And he wrote this book called The Ruins of Empires and talking about how uh, these ruins had all of the information and knowledge about what brought into existence modern civilization. And in his book, he basically in essence said that the people that are ostracized and looked down upon were the people who brought the sciences and mathematics and all of the things that we use today for civilization, but yet they are looked down upon as if they haven't contributed anything to civilization. Well, when Thomas Jefferson got hold of that book, 
it was published, but he left out that part about Africans being in the forefront of, of, uh, of uh, other ethnicities in terms of this information. Well, when Baltnik came to America and saw what had happened, he insisted that it be republished with that quote in it. Okay, yes. But Thomas Jefferson did take that out because he, I guess at that time, you know, here you are, how can you justify enslavement yeah. and the treatment of African Americans when here this information is saying that they were the ones in the forefront of civilization? So, yes, Joe, that was uh, absolutely what happened. Melinda, you have your hand up. Yes, I oh, thank you so much, Rob. Um, when they went, the Greeks went to Africa, did they go throughout Africa or just to Egypt? No, they basically went to, to Kemet or Egypt for their studies. And they, they, they studied in the temple of, of, of Luxor, which is called, which the African called a pedasut, the most holy of holies. And uh, that, that temple could hold up to 100,000 students. And it's really interesting too, in terms of the priesthood, since you mentioned that, Melinda. Mm -hmm. The priesthood was structured so that the priest would, would go and stay in the temple for, um, I think it's about two months. In the time they were doing their priestly duties, they had to abstain from sex. They were uh, not uh, with their families because they were doing their priestly by our duties. They had to shave their heads, they had to take baths every day. That's why you had the, the, uh, the pools, the sacred um, uh, uh, baths in the temple. And, uh, and so they would take baths every day, they had to shave their heads. They were focused on cleansingness and they had to abstain from, from sex. Then they would go back to their families, okay, for a period of time and they would rotate. All right, and if you remember the early Catholic Church, uh, the priests were allowed to be married, okay? But at some point in time, the, uh, a decision was made that they would not be able to be married because the idea of they wanted to live the life, life of Christ, okay? Now, after that happened, after that rule change occurred, the Catholic Church became the richest church in the world. Coincidence? Was that the intent? I don't know, but those are the facts. Mm. Okay. All right. Okay, we have one more. One question. other, one other. Um, is with the, the symbol, the Greek key, is there uh, African meaning to it? The Greek key? You yeah, see my chain. I'm, I'm, okay, I, I can't. I can't see. I'm. I'm not sure about that, Melinda. No, I. Okay. I don't. Okay, I'm not sure. We have one more question in the chat. Uh, what part of nature is the basis of the metric system? The part of nature, the rotation of the planet, the time. The, the time it takes. If you put a stick in the ground, okay, and basically put another stick. Further away, or a mile or so away, how long does it take for the shadow to get from that that stick to another stick? So that's what, how they were able to do it. And you had a number of Greek scholars who were given credit for that discovery, but we know that that basically well, that's how they were able to do it in Africa. John, you want to follow up? What does it answer your question? Of the shadow. Mm -hmm. Dan. Yes, John. Dan, go ahead. Oh, Dan. You're muted, Dan. Uh, he's unmuted, but I can't hear him. Looks like a failure on the microphone. Maybe you can type it in the chat, your question. Sorry, we can't hear you.
Still can't hear you, Dan. Okay, well, while he's trying to get his uh, um, sound correct, let me read you. Um, I got a question here from the chat. Um, <laughs> this is from Kathy uh, Ricky to everyone. Dr. Whiting, I must leave. Thank you so much for your presentations. So important to have this knowledge. Just a point of speculation. The Hebrew people are the happy or happy have no known origin, at least by biblical scholars. Abraham and Sarah are from 200 BCE. Why not Kim in Africa and some of the theological narratives that are reflected in Judaism and Christian Christianity? The first Christians were Jews, were not in the blood and memories of the Hebrew people. Okay, um, I think what she, what she well, let, let me, um, I don't quite get what she's trying to say here, but let me touch on this. The, the first indication we have of a people who are, are Semitic, the Semites were the Hyssops. Um, they invaded uh, Akemet, okay? Uh, uh, and that was the reason for the uh, second intermediary period. But when they invaded, they only controlled the northern part of the country, which is up near Alexandra. And they, they ruled for, for 200 years. It was a brutal rule. And um, so that is the only evidence of, uh, of a, a Semitic people coming into um, Kemet and basically living there for a period of 200 years. And they were eventually a run out because again, every time the civilization of um, Egypt was restored, it was because it came from Nubia and Ethiopia. It came from, it came from the Southern part. They basically uh, created these massive armies and, and they ran the Hyssops out. Okay, but that is the only evidence we have of a, a what we would the people that they show look sort of like Semitic looking, who basically lived and basically uh, were in Kemet, uh, but they came in as invaders. So I, I I don't know if that answers her question or not. But uh, uh, let me let me add something to that. I just uh, I have a friend of many years, and I just learned that she is Ibibio. The Ibibio were people who left northern Judah before the uh, Babylonian captivity, left to toward uh, Egypt, and then settled in uh, western Nigeria. Some of the people there still practice the old religion, she says. Well, it's really interesting, Ryan Ho, that you say that because when we went Ghana, uh, the Ashanti, uh, our God, as a matter of fact, told us that his family history goes all the way back to to Egypt, and that they were they they were run out because of the invasions, and that's how they got to Ghana. And he said that this is a common story of a number of the uh, uh, ethnic groups in Ghana. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Certainly, there are uh, African Jews. Oh yes! Oh, absolutely! Yeah. Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, in fact, they they uh, they were they were fleeing because of conflict, and uh, they had to kind of they had a little a hassle getting into um, um, Israel, and when they did get to Israel. They were claiming that they were the original the Hebrews because they could go all the way back and, and uh, in terms of their stories. And I think that there was some tug of war between um, uh, the Jews in Israel today and, and, these, and, these, um, and these African Jews. I don't know how that was resolved, but uh, 
I do remember reading about uh, some of the yeah. some of these discussions. Yes. Pan, can you speak now? Sorry, we can't hear you. Dan? All right, Joe? Uh, uh, there, there are Jews all over Africa. And um, uh, what you're saying is right. And there, there, there was a lot of dispute. And for the most part, uh, because of technology today, it has been resolved uh, through DNA. So, ah. uh, and, and, and Israel, uh, the state of Israel, does recognize these people. As a matter of fact, there's one sect in South Africa that Israel has identified as the lost tribe. And the people in South Africa says, what do you mean lost tribe? We've <laughs> never been lost. We've been <laughs> Jews. We've always been Jews. They've always practiced Judaism. Okay. And we, they've never been lost. They always knew who they were. The rest of the world didn't know, didn't believe who they were, but they never, uh, 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 they, they never uh, uh, gave up uh, saying that they were um, original uh, uh, Jewish people. And DNA proved that they were. Well, well you know, it, that's why we see similarities between all of these religions. In fact, when you look at Buddhism, yeah, I'll go. I'll try again. when you look at Buddhism, when you look at when you look at Buddhism, you can trace its roots all the way back to Africa. Okay, uh, so so we see remnants at, at bits and pieces of of this spirituality in in most religions right. because so, it's, it's sprung from one a one central point. Okay, any more questions? I, I think Dan is finally. Can you hear us now? Yes, yes, we can. Oh, okay, all right, good. How you doing, Joanne? <laughs> okay. Okay. Oh, okay, I have a. You can hear me? Yes, I, yes, we can, Dan. Okay, I don't know what's happened. <laughs> anyway, uh, Rob, you mentioned that Plato and Aristotle. Uh, referred to how they got, how the Greeks got information con concerning math mm -hmm. and uh, writing. Now, were those from writings of Plato and Aristotle? And if so, from which uh, sources of their, their work or from what sources otherwise did that come from? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, when you look at uh, book, book two, of, um, of, of, oh, I, I referenced book two of um, Herodotus. I mean, he specifically spells out everything. And then if you, if you go and look at the writings of, of, of Aristotle, I don't know the exact uh, part of the book, but the quotes that I, I read you were exact quotes. I mean, those, those were exact quotes from, from his writings. But, but they had, all of the Greek scholars admitted, starting with Thales, who was the first Greek scholar, uh, Thales encouraged his students to go to Africa, okay? I mean, that, that was common among the Greeks. And the Greeks never tried to hide that. It's just that when modern historians started writing the history, they started basically, in fact, for, for example, when you look at Herodotus, in his writings, their scholars of day are saying, yes, Herodotus was right on a lot of things, but when it came to Africa, he was drunk or he, well, I don't know, whatever, but we, we, they try to discard that, okay? And so we still see this trend uh, today, Dan, and it's this, these battles are being fought. That's why if, uh, you know, I took uh, introduction to philosophy and everything started with the Greeks. They basically downplayed the contribution that came from Africa, you know? And so it was as if, and that's why we call it the Greek miracle because the Greeks have no history, okay? That's why the Greek philosophers were prosecuted because they were bringing a foreign doctrine 
into Greece that was not part of their culture. So when you look at all of the evidence, it points to the fact that uh, modern day scholars wanted to give credit to, to, to the Greeks for Western civilization and basically cut the Africans out in terms of their contributions. And that's not saying that the Greeks didn't take that information and enhance it in terms of uh, some of the things that they did, but th th there's still this push today because as I've mentioned to you a number of times, you can go to any college and take a philosophy course and they're not gonna start with Africa. They're gonna start with Greek and they're gonna basically attribute all of the, 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 the scientific findings to Greeks, et cetera, et cetera. But when you look at the history, you can see that that is distorted and is not true. Okay. And now, and what you, if you want a, the exact page and that type of thing, what I can do, Dan, I have your email. I, I can go in, I'll, I'll look at that quote again and I'll, I'll send you that information. But I also want to say to the audience, uh, Dan is, is very, very heavy. Dan was, we, were, we had a, a real nice discussion with Ryan Hole on um, energy and the various theories and quantum physics, et cetera. And um, Dan had my head spinning. Okay, I can tell you that much. So he's, he, he's, he's very well informed and very well read, <laughs> okay? Okay. Um, anyone else? No, I would. I would appreciate it if you would send me that information oh, okay. uh, email realm. Okay, I will. I will. Thank you. Okay. Were you able to hear me? I, I see my sister Carol there. How you doing, Carol? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead. Ryan, can you hear me? What's that? Could you hear me? Yes. I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Testing the uh, microphone device. Uh, right. Okay. You don't want to... <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I, I... Adrian, any questions? Marvin, any questions? One more thing, Rob. Uh, I, uh, I I know I know you can't go to you might not you can't go to Egypt now because of uh, the pandemic and because of political situations. But um, I had an opportunity to go, and uh, I'm going to tell mm -hmm. you, it was a life changing uh, trip uh, yes. because you get an opportunity once you, once you, and you need to spend some time there. Um, uh, you know, we travel all over the entire country, and uh, once you understand, once you start seeing, once you see buildings that look like the Acropolis that predates right. the Acropolis, right, right. What does that tell you? I mean, I mean, so, and once you see gardens that uh, and uh, and and sites set up that look just like sites in Rome that predate uh, the the sites in Rome, uh, it's it was it was an amazing experience. And uh, we happened to have a guy that was an Egyptologist and he was um, uh, very well educated. And he, um, he, he, he pointed out a fact to me, uh, we were talking about ancient Egyptians and he, he said that ancient Egyptians did not look like me. He was pointing to himself because he said, if you looked at my DNA, he said, I can assure you that in my DNA, there is some Greek and probably some Roman in my DNA. He looked white. He said, "Ancient Egyptians look like my friend here. He looked look like me." So he was. He was. He. It was. It was. It was absolutely a life changing experience for me. Yeah. Well, you know, I I had a spiritual experience in the in the temple of Edfu, and um, it was really interesting. It was, uh, you know, I'm I, based on my life, and based on my readings. Now, our ancestors are there for us. We have to ask. I mean, there are times when I see my mother, I see her face, I see her smiling, okay? And there, there have been times when I've seen her face and she wasn't smiling because I wasn't doing something 
I should have been doing. Maybe someone, I perceived someone had done something to me and I was, and I, instead of me um, looking at it and, 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 and staying positive, I was having ne negative thoughts. And, and I could see her face. I mean, I really see it. And same thing with my father. I, I could see his face. Um, sometimes he'd be smiling. Sometimes he'll just be looking at me. And now I know some of you may think I'm crazy, but it doesn't happen that often. But I know that my parents come to me at various times, okay? Because I can see their faces and I can see whether they're smiling or not. Oh. They got quiet. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's heavy. <laughs> That's spooky stuff. <laughs> it's true, but it's true. But it's true. Yeah. But people don't talk about it because that's the feeling. Other people have had feelings like that too and experiences oh, yeah. like that. Uh, but until you come together and really talk about others have had experience. Yes. Yeah, that's that strong um, spiritual African. I, I, that, that's all I can say. Mm -hmm. That's Have what you had experiences like that, Adrian? Huh? Oh, yeah. sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. I sure. Because the, I'll, I'll share this with you real fast. Doing my genealogy, my mom, my mom, on my mom's side is heavily African, and it wasn't that long ago. Um, her great, great, no. My great great grandmother, which was her great grandmother, uh, was a slave. So she knew at least two sets of slaves. And my mother was older; she had children. In those days, it was uh, she had her, us all in her thirties to forty. I mean, people started having children in their twenties, so she was late. She couldn't have children when she did; she couldn't stop. <laughs> so, <laughs> but she told us before, and and I lost my mom. Uh, when I was in my 20s, but she told us these experiences about Africa. So it was really strong. Her upbringing was strongly with African and African roots and African um, history. And I've gone back to Georgia where she was. Uh, and, and many times I say, you know, someone being poor, well, they weren't, pro they were not poor, they were po. Mm -hmm. Many of us know the difference. Yes. They were yes. poor. They lived off the land, mm -hmm. and um, many of the uh, the the medicines and the roots and the things like that. This is what we grew up with because we we were we were poor, mm -hmm. and we did not have a, we didn't go to the doctors. But my mom used to say, everything that you need is from that land out there. It can cure everything. And that was the roots and, and from, the, from the earth. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and I, I feel that vibe, you know, with coming up and co coming up in light probably in my, in my seasoned years now, you know, you go back to that and you really see the importance of uh, that connection uh, because we don't have those distractions any, anymore like we had before. Right. Well, yeah. think, think about what well, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, I'm yeah. Think about Harriet Tubman. Yeah. You saw the movie. Oh, I well, mean, I, you, I studied her for quite a bit and taught okay. her. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so the fact that the things that they that she, that she did, yeah. I mean, it, it had to be a spiritual component. How can you yeah. walk across a river and not drown and no and 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 you've been she's been guided by something that's beyond anything that we can comprehend in, in this existence. And I think last month I talked about my meditation, how I went into, I went beyond the senses, okay? And I was there with the bright white light, okay? It, it, it was, a, it was a, a major turning point in my life to, to experience that. And I basically, it, 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 it I had to reflect and really understand. It took me years and years to figure out what that really meant. But there is something beyond us if we can go into ourselves and basically understand it and let ourselves go and stop thinking. And um, I know that one of the things I've learned too is that we really have to 
stop trying to rationalize and think our way out of stuff. And I know Marion Barry was a type of person, he was the mayor of DC, that he always went by his gut. If he met someone and if his instincts told him, you know, I mean, he didn't deal with you. That was it. He didn't like you. Miles Davis was like that. If he met you and whatever feeling that, whatever instinct they had, if that instinct told them that not to deal with you, they never, they never changed. They never dealt with you. So it's really interesting that some people are like that. They just follow their instinct. Mm -hmm. yeah. and we all have it. We just yes. don't tap into it. And, and, and yeah. Adrian, I can tell you one thing. When I don't follow my instinct and overthink it and rationalize it, I'm usually wrong. I'm usually wrong. Every time. Yeah. Every time. Yeah. Okay, let me go ahead. In in religion, you know, we won't make that connection to Africa, but we know that God speaks to us and guides us, and we pray, and we see that God. We 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 practice uh, look reading our dreams and our daydreams and. It's like the three ways that God will guide us and speak to us. And it's all going back to the African traditions and spirituality. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, they, and they practice a lot of things that we have been known to call it like witchcraft <laughs> and, and mm -hmm. voodoo. And, um, but it was a strong spirituality. It, it was, extremely strong, uh, strong spirituality. We just didn't understand what they were doing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Well, Harriet, you from the South, you know, yeah. you know, down there, they did things real different, but you, 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 you didn't understand it then, but we kind of understand it now. Unfortunately, because of how it was perceived, it was not passed on. On to. In the way, I mean, I wish that I had talked with my great grandmother. Me too. About, they used to talk about the roots, you know, and like you said, you could for healing for anything, except that you didn't talk about it because there, because of the um, way they, they, they thought, thought they were being perceived. But, but you know, I, I think exactly. Harry's mom was a, a a very special person from the standpoint that she was very religious, but she was open to new information. Um, and she knew where I was, but she accepted me even though where she was was different. And I always admired her for that because of uh, the fact that she was very, very religious. And she really, I mean, you're talking about, but I think that it's similar to what I saw in Ghana. They were very religious. And I asked our guide, um, Selassie, I said, well, you know, I, I said, I, I never knew that Africans were this religious. He said, yes, but they have maintained this, uh, uh, a large part of their spirituality. Okay. In addition to being uh, to, to being religious, and so I think that that's that's the, that's uh, what happens to a lot of African Americans. They're very religious, but the spirituality is there that keeps them trying to do. I'm talking about. I'm going to talk about everybody now because we got some real criminals and all that kind of stuff, and people who will do you in in a second. But I'm talking about the the the, the general people that I have dealt with in my life, in terms of my family and, and others, that even though we may slip up, we try to abide by the tenets of truth, justice, order, righteousness, etc. And in fact, and, and Adrian, you talked about voodoo. One of the reasons that the Haitians were able to defeat Napoleon 
twice they defeated the, the French right. was because of their spirituality. Yep. And, Can I say? And the Haitians are being punished to this day for that because the, the, the French, even though they're known to be liberal, they demanded that the Haitians pay them restitution for all of the land and stuff that they had already stolen from the from from the air. and so that 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 put uh, Haiti in debt that they've never been able to get out of, and is now the poorest nation in the Western Hemisphere, and for some reason, nobody's helping them, and I'm just wondering, I don't know if they're still being punished for the fact that they were able to defeat the French twice. Absolutely, absolutely. That's the still quite and, and, poor. Oh, <laughs> yes, no question. Bad shape, bad shape. Can I say, um, when I was in middle school, I went to Catholic school from like the fifth grade to the eighth grade. And there was just something missing. While I was in school, I became a five percenter in Catholic school because, you know, there's something missing when you're studying uh, and uh, religion and, and Jesus is white and the, just the spirit, you just is this just something missing and when you go to study philosophy you know there's it's just like in in your in your in your fiber of your soul you just know something's missing uh i, I don't know if that's a common thing but it just you know i think it's 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 somewhere in our in our mind it's it's obvious well, Melinda, you know, re religion is man's attempt to explain the unexplainable. No one, that divine intelligence we call God, we, we understand if we, if we look at nature, that there is a divine presence in the universe, okay? It's perfect. They, even though one animal may kill another animal the whole bit, but they're doing it because to keep everything in a line with this perfection, all right? And, and, and un, unfortunately, Africans were the first ones to come up with the concept of depicting God as a, as a man. And that set off what we have up to today, okay? Because people took that concept and basically, and I'm, I'm sure they did it for a reason because we have to understand that when we look at history, not only did it keep them unified because everybody was thinking in the same uh, uh, direction, but we saw the same thing that happened in Europe when Christianity was what, when, when, the, when the Romans went out and the other people went out and they started conquering other people, they imposed Christianity on these various groups in Europe, and that was and that was the major foundation for the unification of Europe. Okay, even though they fought amongst themselves, they had a unifying concept of God that looked like them, and it allowed them to come together as as a whole and to basically go out and and conquer the world. So, but up until that time, the even though they had a a depiction a saw of, of uh, as as a god when you look at the at the writings they didn't have a clue as to what this divine intelligence that we call god was or looked like you know just to, it, humans can't even conceive of something being beyond what we look like okay and so as a result of that we have all you know every, you know like the arabs had their version the, the Indians had their version. Their gods looked like them. I mean, every ethnic group that comes up with a, a, a concept of God as a man, it looks like them, okay? And which is natural, but we don't know. We know that there's a divine, uh, uh, divine president, presence in the universe, but nobody has a clue as to what that is, whether it's not, whether it's even a human, we don't know. But we just make these feeble attempts to come up with these concepts 
and they serve their purpose by unifying people and allowing people to go out and, and conquer other people, et cetera, and control them. You know, before Europeans got unified, there was a lot of bloodletting. The yes. Turingians and the Saxons were yes. uh, decimated by yes. Charlemagne. I don't know yes. why he was called the Great, but <laughs> <laughs> he stumped a lot of people there. Okay, John, go ahead. What happened to the goddess in Kemet? Spirituality. What happened to the goddess? Okay. 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 What, what happened was once the see the woman, okay, let me go back and, 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 and explain this. What happened in Africa that where the woman role was really equal to the man in a sense. Mm -hmm. And that's why they have, in fact, you can say even above the man because the lineage passed through the woman. It's a matriarchal type in ancient Africa was a matriarchal uh, system. It was until the Arabs came in, okay, mm -hmm. with their version and put the man in, in sub and made the woman subordinate and the mm -hmm. Christians came in and did the same thing. Right. So since uh, most of these African countries were conquered by either the Arabs or, or the Christians, the they have taken on some of that the same behavior where they put the woman, push the woman back. Okay, uh, so 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 we see that. But I see that in in my family, um, my mother was a, a matriarch. I remember, and my sister is is, is here. Uh, when mom was alive, every Fourth of July, every Thanksgiving and Christmas, there was nobody who didn't show up. I mean, it was like you were going to show up for those three holidays as a family, okay? Once my mom passed away, mm -hmm. all of that disappeared, hmm. okay? So, I think so, so that's the strength and the power that that these that these women had, or at least in 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 in, in our family. Yeah. Um, I think it's also interesting linguistically. Uh, contemporary Sudanese uh, languages are unmarked. No strange person. And that I think is kind of an uh, intriguing phenomenon. That I'm, I'm uh, listening to a discussion on. Okay, let me see if I can mute you. <laughs> okay, you are muted. Um, anyway, we, we have, uh, um, um, I don't know, actor, actress, those are gender marked. Sudanese dialects are not gender marked. And I think ancient Kemet, uh, Kemet uh, the uh, Kandake ruled. She was the boss, uh, so to speak. And her warriors were fierce enough that Alexander also a great one, uh, undeservedly, didn't dare move toward uh, Kemet and was satisfied with just doing Lower Egypt. Right, right, exactly. You know, I also want to, yeah, I also want to commend uh, the uh, Unitarian Universal Congregation of Owen Beach. Um, I, I really appreciate your openness and willingness to uh, listen uh, to information that is uh, out of the mainstream, if you will. I think it says a lot about what you are about in your mission. And I want to commend you for that. Yeah, the theory is to help everyone build their own theology. That's okay. what... Uh, Unitarian Universalism is all about. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, it's uh, probably getting close to uh, bedtime, huh? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Thank you, I, thank I, you. I, I, I want everyone, I wish everyone a happy holiday. Stay home. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Stay safe. I, I, I think we've canceled all of our plans and uh, stay alive and be healthy. You too. 
You too, you, Rob. You as well. too. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Bye. how are you going to continue this, Rob? <laughs> I, 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 look, I, I'll you talk to Ron Holt. I, I think, I, I think Ron Holt's going to. He's going to bring in some movies and that type of thing. So okay, we have okay. things that are still going on, and I will keep everybody notified. And we got to keep it going. We got yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. And, 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 and Adrian, you and Marvin have been you've been wonderful because you've been in all of the lectures. I mean, you you you, you, you guys have some big brains. All right. <laughs> no, <laughs> I see. Yeah. But it's just it's well absorb worth it. it all. The exposure is well worth it, and we continue we with your it. reading list. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Fantastic. Because I can only talk to you all about it. It's not so many other people I can talk about it. So. We, the ones we can, we need to pull them in. So okay. Yes. It'll start to expand. Believe me. Forget that. It really will. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank Take you. care, everybody. Enjoy.